As we go to the Lord now, make sure you're in fellowship by confessing your sins. And let's do that. Let's go to the Lord. Well, Father, we are grateful for all your grace and mercy. It's the only way we survive. It's the only way we live. And yet beyond that, Father, it's our great hope. It's the fact that we have already overcome through Christ. By trusting in his death, burial, and resurrection, we've been given eternal life, never to lose it. We're citizens of heaven and part of the royal family, indwelt by the Spirit. We're in union with Christ. We're his body. We're going to live forever with him, with you. Nothing can stop it. We've already won, and yet we're still here in the battle. Help us not pursue happiness, Father. Help us pursue you. Help us pursue truth and adventure and the, the, the victory <clears throat> in this war against the forces of evil that have infiltrated even our own very governments. Pray that you give us wisdom about these things. In Christ's name, amen. All right. I've been doing a study. I've been looking in 1 Peter again, which is something I do, but... In the book of 1 Peter, I call this the submission series. He uses the word hupotasso, submit, uh, five, I mean, six different times, and he deals with four different areas that were troubling the believers, the churches. And so, in our introduction, one of the themes of 1 Peter is following the example of Jesus by entrusting yourself to the righteous judge and submitting to legitimate human authority, humbly submitting as, as a servant with an undeserved suffering. So, Christ came under judgment from governments, two governments, and governments were used to prosecute him and send him to the cross. And so none of it was legal, none of it was right, and yet he submitted to it. So what does that mean for us? I want, I want to try to bring common sense to this. So Peter gives us an answer to this, but he deals with government and slaves and masters and deals with submission in marriage and in the church. So... He's writing to believers, both Jew and Gentile, scattered about the Roman province of Asia, which is our modern-day Turkey. And these people are being persecuted for their faith. And history tells us by the Roman government, by Nero, who ruled Rome from 54 to 68. We believe the first Peter was written around 60 to 62 right in the heart of Nero's rule. So, in this book, Peter's going to draw a distinction, and this is what one of his main ideas, a distinction between suffering because of your sins and shortcomings and failures compared to suffering as in sharing the sufferings of Christ, suffering for your faith because of God. Suffering because you're obeying, i.e. submitting to God. So those are two different things. If you're suffering because of your own shortcomings, because those are, those are transformation issues. If you're suffering because of your sins, that's called self-induced misery. That's one kind of suffering. It's the suffering I believe we most experience until we're in these mature places in the Christian life. As a baby believer, I made, I mean, I was constantly shooting myself in the foot. So now I just drop things on my foot. Uh, yeah. So he draws this distinction and it's very important. So if you're, if you'll turn to first Peter, you have Bibles, turn to first Peter and we want to look at 1 Peter 2, just for this idea, 18 through 20. So, apparently y'all are there. All right. 
He says, servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect. Now, this is not employment, but that's our application to it is employment. Not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. And that word means to be very harsh. For this finds favor if for the sake of conscience toward God, a man bears up under sorrow or suffering, or excuse me, when suffering unjustly. Okay, unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? <laughs> what benefit is that? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. This is divine good. This is rewardable in eternity. You can also find the same idea in chapter 4, verse 12 through 19. This is this, is this idea of submission under undeserved suffering is all through here. It may be his thing. All right. So, again, most Christian suffering is caused by self-induced misery. The mature believer begins to suffer for their faith. I don't know that I've actually suffered outside of my um, immediate vicinity for my faith. The government has never persecuted me for my faith that I know of. Nobody's knocked on my door and wanted to take my Bibles. So, but, you know, we're in a changing nation. Times are coming that are different than they've been. So, secondly, Peter gives instructions to submit. Listen, his answer, by and large, and this is not just some blanket law, this is not a rule. Christianity doesn't operate by rules. It operates by walking in the Spirit and unconditional love. That's what, and wisdom that comes out of that to honor the Lord and do what's right as the Spirit leads you. It's not a system of rules to keep. So, but he says the general idea when dealing with this situation, you're unfairly treated by, by legitimate authority. You generally, his general advice from the Lord, submit. Hupatasso. The hupatasso has a range of meanings. On one end, it's a military word that means you better obey or you go to the brig. You know, if you don't obey, then somebody's going to put hands on you and make you do something you don't want to do. All the way down on the other end, the word hupatasso means to open your mind to be influenced. It means to be respectful and open, respecting this person and their wisdom that you would listen to them and give them a fair hearing to see if what they're saying aligns with God's Word. You're open to be influenced. That's the range. And you see that in these different areas. With government, you know, when... Of course, I, you know, you try to argue this. If you, if you break the speed limit and you get caught and they write you a ticket and you say, well, I wasn't hurting anyone. Well, that's true. But you were breaking the law. You get a ticket. Then what do you do? You got to pay it. Unless you want to go to court and fight it and then you have to pay it and then pay the court costs. So people just generally pay it. Slaves and masters, this was, these were indentured servants. These weren't employees. So they didn't have a right to walk away. If they walked away, they went to the brig. So they have to obey. In marriage, it's a completely different kind of hupatasso, in my opinion, that it's being open to the influence of the head, who is Christ, and then the husband, to the wife, and then the kids. It's headship. It's not, it's not just rank military authority. So it's influence. It's allowing yourself to be influenced. It's showing respect. It's showing respect to the authority system that God set up. So you may not respect this man. He may not even be worthy of respect. But you respect the position. 
And in doing that, you witness to the angels and you witness to your children. You teach them how to be respectful to authority in life, even when it's unfair. Gary tells the story about Bum Phillips, you know, the guy that whipped the guy that was not even guilty. And later on, you know, he said, I thought, you know, if I, you, it, it, you didn't catch me, you know, I wasn't guilty that time, but I'd been guilty about a hundred other times, so I deserved it anyway. But anyway, and finally, he talks about the church and how younger men, which we have a number of those now, or to think about and deal with elders. And he talks about humility. So, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. If you'll look there with me. This is our first section. We'll look at 13 through 17. He says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether a king, to a king as the one who is in authority. All right, so let's look at this. Let's just look at some highlights here. The word submit uh, is hupatasso. It's an aorist passive imperative. The aorist imperative means now. It's a now. If it's a present imperative, it means ongoing. You're to obey all the time. It's an ongoing look. But this is a point in time. It's like, do it. When the law comes, you deal with the law, you obey it. You submit to it. So, this word means to comply, to obey, submit. It's a pretty strong context here. Submit now, immediately. And he says, why do you do this? It's real important. Why do you do this? Why do you submit to human cre uh, ordinances, human creations? Because of the Lord. Because of the Lord. And this is really important. You know, you do these things. In fact, God wants you to do everything you do because of Him. Now, we do all kinds of things, especially in our immature stages of Christianity that are for our benefit. And of course, this is for your benefit. But this is more so for the Lord's benefit. When we get down to the common sense of how to deal with unfair government, you're going to have to understand that the real priority is not your human freedom. Now, when you're in an immature stage, that's very difficult to accept or apply. It's only in the mature stages when you're suffering for Christ that you can allow unfair authority, especially from government, impersonal government, with illegal unconstitutional laws to, to push you into doing anything without standing up. There's a time to stand up. There's a way to stand up. But then there's a time because of the Lord, because of ministry, because of the individuals involved that you are ministering to, that you submit to that. Your submission to the Lord, regardless of the situation, is the ministry that brings people into eternal life which is more important than your human freedom. Now you say, well, I don't, I don't care about them. I'm going to have my freedom if I can. Well, then that, that's the decision that you make. But, so he says, submit for the Lord's sake to benefit the Lord. Why? Because you love the Lord. You want to further His cause. Our mission in service is to produce divine good. Right thinking, then, excuse me, do the right thing in the right way for the right reason. That's divine good. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4 talks about praying for government so that we can lead a tranquil life free to evangelize. So, this is all part of God's plan. Government is part of God's plan. All right? So, then he says, to human institutions, and that's really interesting, it's the word catesis, which comes out of day one, two, three, four. It's the word Genesis 1 1, bara. It's the Greek word that stands in for bara. God just created these things. He created freedom in human life. 
the sanctity of human life in freedom for volition. He created marriage, family. He created nations and governments. He created free enterprise. Those are institutions. Those are things that run through history. They're for the human race, not just for believers. They're for everyone. So the human race can maintain, without these things, the human race would literally destroy itself. Or the devil would do it. You know, he would, you know, when you got 7 billion people on the earth, he can't hardly manage that. So he wants to get it down to less than that. So he can manage it. Though, all right, so God created the divine institutions and delegated authority to them, his authority. Romans 13, 1. I'm sorry, my one wasn't working. It says Romans 3, 1. It's 13, 1. It says God arranged these institutions. The word tasso means to put them in order. So the all legitimate delegated authority structures among men come from God, legitimate ones. So he says in verse 13 and 14, submit for the Lord's sake to these human creations that got these things God created for the human race, whether to kings, kings in authority, or governors that he appoints and sends. Why does he appoint government? Here's what it says. So uh, to punish lawbreakers and praise well-doers. It's to keep order in society. It's to keep evil from overcoming the good. So, he says, such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. So, watch this. Unfair authority in your life. Because of your, your faith in the Lord and your willingness to Surrender yourself, submit yourself to Him. Listen to me, all submission is to God. Whether it's to a husband or a policeman, it's to God. You're submitting to God. So, it's not only for your benefit. I mean, is it smart to submit to the policeman? As a rule. So, as a rule. So anyway, he says, such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. So you do the right thing. You submit to a legitimate authority. And this becomes a ministry that reveals God and these people that were persecuting them and criticizing them for their faith. It silenced them. God became obvious. God became real. See, when your faith is an action in the face of conflict with people that doubt, that are critical, your trust. See, it's the same thing he says about the wife, that the wife's tranquility and surrender and submission to God becomes a ministry to the husband. What's the same thing here? Your surrender to unfair authority in your life in the right situation, in the will of God, like Jesus, is a great ministry to bring people to Christ. The Philippian jailer. Okay? Now this is what Peter's talking about. Peter's not just talking about how to deal with unfair government, because they were in unfair government. He's talking about that this is your opportunity for a ministry to the individuals involved in it. Okay? So... The believer's humility and submission because of love for God reveals the presence of God, the grace of God. They were enduring persecution for ignorant, from ignorant and foolish men for their faith. And Peter says that your obedience to even an unfair king and, or the unfair laws reveals a unique life of faith in Christ. So in verse 16 he says, And act as free men. And do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as a bond slave of God. So, he says, you've been freed spiritually. You're not under the sin nature. You don't have to live under the sin nature. You don't have to react and sin in this situation. I mean, 
for many years of my life, I would, I would go, well, this is not right. Don't tell me I have to give in to this. This is not right. Peter says, I know that. I know that. So what is important to you? Is God important? Do you love Him? Do you want to minister to these souls so they could possibly live forever? Or do you just want to have what you want? You just want to have the conveniences and the human freedom that you require and demand. I think that's what he's trying to say here. Act as free men, but use your freedom as not as a covering for evil, but to use it as a bond slave of God. So listen, what is it that's in your life right now that's unfair? What's unfair in your life right now? Somebody down on you, somebody asking something of you, somebody needing from you that, you that they don't deserve? What's in your life right now that's unfair? Think about that. How can you... Why do you think God's got that in your life? Do you think He could remove that? Of course He could. But He doesn't. He leaves it for you to grow into this awareness of your opportunity, I'm not going to say responsibility, I'm going to say your opportunity to grow into this, to be able to, to give grace and mercy to even those who are trying to unfairly command you or use you. All right, so you act as free men because you are. Galatians 5.1 It was for freedom that Christ set us free. In verse 13, he says, But don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another in love. Often when people learn that they can't lose their salvation, that they're securing Christ, they begin, as, as baby believers, they, they, uh, they abuse God's grace. They take liberties that really aren't, that don't edify them or others. They take liberties. I'm guilty. I've taken some liberties. I love a good liberty, to be honest with you. Uh, but it doesn't edify. Doesn't help anything. Doesn't help you. Doesn't help the people around you. Doesn't help. You know, it's not, you're wasting, it's wasting time. How much time do you have? You think, oh, I got a lot of time. Yeah, you think so? You rich fool. Today your soul is required of you. Remember that? You don't know. You don't have time. You have right now. Use your time wisely right now. Use it for spiritual purposes. You are spiritually free from the dictates of man. And you don't, listen, you don't have to obey unfair authority. You don't have to. But you know what? You got to be willing to accept the consequences of that. Use your freedom to win them to the Lord through your humility because you love the Lord. Now, in verse 17 is the most unique verse that I've ever found in the Bible. It's very unique. Let me read it to you. He says, Honor all men, or, or give respect, do respect, love the brothers, the brotherhood, the body of Christ, fear God, and honor the king. Those are four imperatives right together. Four orders, four commands right together. It's like a summary. So the summary is the word honor to me means to consider something valuable. And he uses it twice. And he's talking about all people, even these people, these soldiers in the Roman days that were persecuting them, the government officials that didn't have any respect for Christianity that were persecuting them the Jewish leaders who refused to trust in Christ, who were persecuting them, the difficulties they were having from merchants, all the different things in the society that was against them. They were struggling with all that. All right? And he says, we don't fight against flesh and blood. Honor, do give respect. See value in those people involved in it. Then he says, love the brothers. Be committed to love your fellow believers. You know, in this book, in chapter 1, he talks about the fellow believers as a building of God. And he talks about the priesthood. 
And then he says, reverence God and honor the king. Four commands. So let's apply a little bit. First of all, there's a little, there's little doubt that under Roman rule, the church was being persecuted by the state. There's just history, full, full, history's full of it. First of all, the Jewish synagogues all over the Roman province of Asia, modern day Turkey, hated the Christians and made life hard as they could for them. In 52 AD, old Christ had been risen from the dead for what, 22 years, maybe 20 years. The church is developing. Claudius grew tired that he's the Roman emperor, Roman Caesar, he grew tired of the disturbances between the Jews and Christians. Therefore, he suppressed the Christians. In 64, Rome was burned, probably by arson, and they were blaming Nero, so he passed the blame to who? The Christians. And we could go on. There was just a whole list of them. In 90-something, like 96, Domitian uh, declared himself God the Lord. I, Domitian, the Caesar of Rome, am God the Lord. And, of course, the Christians, he said, you must bow to me. Of course, the Christians didn't like that very much. So, again, Rome was persecuting the church. Church has been persecuted by the state through the centuries so many times it's beyond counting. Behind the governments of the world, though, you must understand the forces of evil are always scheming to hinder or even destroy the church. We don't fight flesh and blood. People who are at the top that are ridiculous, they're not just human beings that power hungry human beings. This is a plan that goes beyond humans that's in being enacted in this nation right now. So behind the governments of the world are these satanic forces. You read in Revelation chapter 20, verse 3 and 8, that the forces of evil deceive the nations, working them always to bring about a one world government. You know, before Christ, all the governments... Every year, if a, government, if a nation got strong, what did they do? They attacked everybody else and took everything they had until they got weak and the next nation grew up and attacked them and took everything they had. And that was history. All the way up, basically, until modern times. And even now, it's going on all over the world. Emo in Nigeria, Muslim bandits are robbing the countryside and they go to churches and the church will you know have a church service and they go in and they kill the men and they steal the women and kidnap them they do it all the time there they kidnap them for ransom and they sell them and it's crazy it's not modern times there so this is what they're trying this is what they're living with with somewhere in the world christians are being killed put in jail, robbed, and kidnapped. My friend Emo, I talk about him. So, God uses the divine establishment laws <clears throat> to suppress evil and demonic activity in a nation. You know, Christianity is not morality. Do you understand the difference between moral, being a moral person and having a relationship with God through Christ? Completely different. Christianity creates you, makes you into a moral person, but you can be a moral person without Christ. But morality is what keeps the society cohesive because people make reasonable choices for their life and they for, therefore they end up making reasonable marriages that stay together and are stable, producing kids that are after their kind, if you will, who go out and do the same thing. And so you have a nation that builds up because of the families. The family is the core issue. The, the morality, the faithfulness of the, of the husband and wife creating the same kind of person in their children. Uh, 
you know, it's very obvious in my life that my parents were faithful and that Rhonda's parents were faithful and that this was never an issue for me. I, I, could, I could talk to her for five minutes and knew that was a part of her character because she'd been raised in that. That was the way she'd been taught and she just absorbed it. So that's what keeps society going. That's the divine establishment. That's the principles for believer and unbeliever. All right, so... God uses the Holy Spirit, though, working in the church to restrain the forces of evil. How? See, when I first read that years ago, I thought, well, the Holy Spirit hovers over the world and restrains evil. No, the Holy Spirit's in you. And so when you educate yourself spiritually and you grow up and become mature spiritually so that you can take responsibility for your life, the influence that the Holy Spirit brings through your life to your six feet around you, to those people, is what restrains evil. So, in the 60s in America, we began to bring in all these evil things. We stopped being a Christian nation and became a crazy nation. So, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. And you know what restrains the devil now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains the Holy Spirit through the church will do so until he's taken out of the way. What's going to take him out of the way? You can answer. What's going to take the Holy Spirit out of the way? The rapture. Right. The church is going to go up. Holy Spirit, you know, so the influence of the church. The church. Now, how's the church doing, you think? How's the church doing overall? I'll leave that there with you. Uh, all right. When, when the Bolsheviks took over Russia in the early 1900s, one of the things that allowed that to happen, there was a number of things. You know, the czars had been cruel and hard on them, and they were tired of that. Uh, they'd been in these wars and wars and war, and they were tired of that. And people came along and promised them, I mean, just blue smoke, that they had a better way, that they were going to make things work. Well, as you looked at what was being said, it was nonsense. You could pull it apart very easily, like... Boys can become girls. Boys can have, get pregnant. Men, I mean, did you, do you hear that? Well, what happened is the more, the sillier it got, the people, the general population was forced to go along with it or be arrested, killed, sent to the gulags. They forced them into it. And so the people just started pretending. Yes, of course, men can have babies. Just to, just to avoid conflict. And so one of the marks of totalitarian takeover is when everybody begins to go along with the nonsense that's being promoted rather than stand up against it. Do you see that? You see that happening? I do. What's coming? To, what's coming? What's coming? folks, and what are we going to do with it? That's what this is about for me. Now, Jesus and the apostles' responses to illicit applications of the Jewish and Roman law. Let's look at this. This is interesting. So we're supposed to obey the law. Now, Jesus never discussed the politics of the Roman rule except to pay Caesar the taxes he demanded. He consistently condemned the evil Jewish leaders for their corrupt theology and traditions. They had turned the gospel message into a, in, in the Mosaic law into a work system. He condemned them for using the law to steal from widows and for the money changing in the temple. They were always trying to catch him in some blasphemy trap, trying to get him to contradict the law so they could murder him because he was interfering with their prophets. In their power. 
So, but, but listen, before the time of the cross, these people were after him illegally. He stayed away from them. He avoided them in the crowds to avoid allowing them to break Jewish law by seizing him and cooking up charges against him. But listen, when it was time, when he knew it was the Father's will, he let them take him. When he knew it was the Father's will, how did he know? Well, he, he, of course, he had a unique connection with the Father. His whole life he'd been connected to the Father without any interruptions, other different than us, but he, when, it, when he believed it was time for him to surrender to the Father's will, to submit to unfair, illegal government laws, when it was time, he gave in to it. He submitted to it, and in doing so, paid for the sins of the world. The disciples refused to comply with illegal persecution and arrests made by the Jewish officials. The same guy, Peter, who's telling us to submit to the government. In Acts chapter 4, both Peter and John were arrested and told not to speak about Christ. That was the law. The, the people in charge had made a dictate, don't speak about Christ. You think they uh, went along with that? Yes? No? No. They didn't do that. They said, we better listen to God rather than man. Acts chapter 5, the apostles were arrested by the jealous Sadducees, and an angel came and released them, and they went to the temple and said, we must obey God rather than man. Here's my point. Government officials had locked them up. An angel came along and opened the door. The law would have said if these Sadducees were right in their law, they would have had to stay if they were going to obey the government. They obeyed God rather than illegal laws. Acts chapter 12, they killed James, the brother of John. They also arrested Peter. They locked him up. An angel released him. He walked out of jail, refusing to comply with the illegal applications of the law. Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas were imprisoned. God sent an earthquake. What did they do? Listen, what did they do? Everybody else is walking out of the jail. They stayed. What was different? Holy Spirit. What was different? Ministry opportunity. What was different? Somebody was coming to the Lord. They're discerning. They're open. They're they're sharp with the Lord. They're walking in the Spirit. They're wide open to do God's will, not their own. Acts chapter 25. Paul's gotten this big scrape and this big conflict. What does he do? He uses, listen, he uses Roman law. Roman law didn't apply to everybody else, but he was a Roman citizen, therefore he could use it. He appealed to Caesar to escape the corrupt Jews. The Jews had convinced, the, I think it was Festus, to bring him to them so that they could attack him. They, they had a conspiracy against him to kill him. And he knew this, and he said, I'm not going to see, I'm not going back to the Jews. I appeal to Caesar. And of course, God had already told him he was going to Rome, but he had to go to Jerusalem. So, believers are allowed to use the laws of the land for their own legal advantage and benefit. There's nothing saying that when you submit to government that you have to not use the laws in the proper way, even if they're trying to use them in an improper way. People sitting in jail in our capital for over a year now, going on two years without habeas corpus or the ability to get out for trespassing. Now, I'm not trying to get political. I'm just saying the law is, is being corrupted. Believers in the United States are responsible to what? The Constitution. I see it's, my time's up. Listen, our law is the Constitution. It's the Constitution. And when laws are passed that aren't constitutional, in my, this is just my opinion. Ron may have a different one. My opinion is that I'm not responsible to 
obey that law, although I'm not going to strap on my weapons and go fight people over it. But if it comes and they try to enforce it on me, then the Spirit's going to show me how to have ministry to those people involved when this happens. And I think that's the point. Father, I pray that you give us wisdom about these issues, these real life issues. These aren't theoretical issues, Father. These are, these are real life issues and maybe, a, maybe they're upon us. Maybe not in Moody in St. Clair County, but across this nation, these things are, these things are becoming real. And I pray, Father, I pray that you, you remove the evil from our land and that you give us courage and that you give us ministry to the people involved in it to bring them to Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen.